uh, for this year. Uh, this is the third year we've been running them like this. We started out um, having lecture series, trying to introduce campus and community to what's happening with sustainability. We used to show really cool TED Talks. There's a lot of really neat TED Talks about sustainability happening that people far, far away from us are doing. And then we bring a local panel in to say, yeah, I do that too, and here's how. And we found that people were like kind of amusing us by watching the video and they were really there to see the local panel. So we switched it all over. We're just featuring local folks. We actually have a panel today. You know, it sounds very official. There's a group of people here to talk about uh, rivers and why we love them and what we are doing with them, around them, and for them. Uh, but there's more coming, so there are brochures out front if you want to take a look. It's also schedules are posted online as well. Um, if you want to check out some other topics, there are a whole bunch of different things that people are doing here in Michiana in terms of sustainability in practice. So I encourage you to check those out. We are also um, recording this, uh, so it'll be posted uh, online on our YouTube channel, uh, so you can watch it again and again. <laughs> uh, if you want, or someone didn't make it, thank you much. Uh, I should introduce myself. I see a lot of familiar faces, but my name is Krista Bailey. I'm the director of the Center for a Sustainable Future here at IUSB, and I get to teach sustainability studies classes, uh, which makes it extra fun. Uh, so, also on the table up front, you may have seen these pictures of beautiful people sitting out on the table. These are our, um, our sustainability graduates that got jobs because of their degrees. So they were hired saying, oh wow, you studied sustainability and you have, well this is Ben, you have a talent for plants. Come be the director of Botanic Gardens at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Okay, so he did. Um, this picture is actually taken at Fernwood when he was in charge of the grounds there. They also hired him coming out of college. So, People get jobs with this, so we have to show them off on our materials. So if you or someone you know is interested in majoring, minoring, or getting a graduate certificate in sustainability, you might want to take one of these home with you. Uh, before we have our panel come up, they have a lot of really wonderful things to, to share with us. I know that you all have a lot of wonderful things to share with one another. So we don't want to miss out on that resource. So our practice at these events is to help build some connections and not just, oh, I just heard someone speak that I've never heard before, but I've met someone who's also interested in these things. So here is your chance before you really dig into those seats to stand up, find someone you don't know at all. Not like, well, I really don't know the person next to me that well. You came with them. So get up, find someone you don't know, and share names. And why you came, what you're hoping to find out here. <laughs> so glad we are meeting one another, describing what drew us here this evening, maybe continuing that connection beyond. Um, I have been remiss in the last couple of these events um, in recognizing uh, where we are. And we're talking a lot about where we are uh, in the talks tonight and why that matters. Um, but I do like to, to share this message. Earlier um, this academic year, last fall, we had some speakers from the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi uh, on campus giving one of these talks um, and reminded us that we're on their land um, and it's great that we get to be here. And they have always been here and they will always be here. So I just wanted to acknowledge where we are. Uh, where this space came from, so that we can uh, continue to honor it as it deserves. And I'm sure we'll hear more about that from our speakers as well. So I'm going to call them up here, and they're going to tell you all kinds of things about why they love rivers. So uh, we're going to get started, uh, but you'll all come up. We'll have a nice whole crowd here. Uh, we've got Matt Mearsman, uh, director of the St. Joe River Basin Commission. We've got Dara Deegan, he's the aquatic biologist for the Elkhart South Bend some long title project <laughs> you'll learn more about shortly. <laughs> and Jonathan Grant, uh, all kinds of amazingness, uh, artist, historian, activist, community builder, likes rivers. <laughs> yes. So, 
three very different perspectives on why rivers are so great. So I'm going to pass the clicker off and uh, let Matt take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Krista. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much for having me here. Um, I feel just really lucky not only to be here tonight talking to all of you, but to be able to call this my job. It, uh, I've served as a volunteer with a group called the Friends of the St. Joe River for over 20 years, or almost 20 years. Started just doing riverbank cleanups, picking up trash and stuff. And since then, I've been able to make a career out of trying to protect and improve rivers, which I didn't even know was an option when I was going to school. So I just feel really lucky to be able to call this my work because it's certainly my passion. And you'll probably see that tonight. It's going to be really hard for me to stay uh, under 15 minutes, but I'm going to do it. Uh, and I want you to know that my passion for this work that I'm doing really comes from a love of being on and in the water. You can find me canoeing on the St. Joe River probably 200 days a year, at least, and all year long. I'll be out there breaking ice this week so that I can get on the river and go canoeing. So I'm, I'm dedicated. I love being on the river, and that's where this stuff comes from for me. So. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to talk to you all about. Uh, well, first, I, I, I just want to set the stage a little more and, and tell you that when I first started this work, I really thought that I needed to convince people to care about the river. That I had to tell them why the river was so important to care about it. And what I've since learned is people already care about the river. People care about clean water. It's 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 pretty wide, and, and I just saw evidence of this last week. There was a public hearing held by the DNR at the public library over a planned development project downtown out over the river. And uh, it was so exciting to see how many people showed up to speak on behalf of the river. And, and it wasn't just people like me who live on the river and use the river all the time. There were elected officials there, the county engineers there. Um, there was a lot of people there concerned about the river. So it just sort of cemented that thing. People already care about the river. So, what I try to do now is tell people, well, what can we do to make the river better? If we all care about the river, what can we do to make the river better? So I'm hoping to be able to touch on some of that later tonight. And if not in the presentation formally, maybe we can talk about it afterward. So there was a time uh, when big factories or municipal wastewater treatment plants were the primary threat to the river. This is a picture of a Unaro plant, the ball band factory, which has been in Mishawaka, right on the river. And I heard all kinds of stories about the terrible things that would be released into the river from this factory. They were dyeing leather, they were making rubber, all kinds of terrible stuff. And so there was a time when our rivers were really polluted. And the primary culprit was things like this, you know, industrial discharges to the river. Uh, the question is now, like, are these still the threats that we should be concerned about? Um, I think for me, as someone who uses the river, it's easy to imagine what? these factories or the wastewater treatment plant when I go paddling by it in my canoe. That's scary. Like, I don't want to tip over when I'm going by there. It's like, that's, that's the nasty stuff. Well, in reality, when you talk to the people that run the wastewater treatment plants, they test this stuff daily, and they swear that the water is cleaner coming out of the treatment plant than it is in the river. So uh, there is some question as to whether these are the things that we should really be concerned about. Not that these aren't still potential threats, and that there are things that here in the city of South Bend, we're still doing a lot of work to try and clean up the occasional sewer overflow that happens from our treatment plant. But uh, I'm here to try to make a case, uh, supported by the EPA and research, that this isn't the primary threat that I want you all to be concerned about. Um, again, not to say that it's not an issue. I think there's something even more important and something that's more directly connected to something we can do. So, no. things changed. And, and a lot of that was the result of the Clean Water Act that was uh, amended or passed in 1972. And, and what that did was it force regulation upon these discharges to the river. It said you have to meet water quality standards in order to be able to release water to the river. And we saw tremendous improvement in the health of our rivers nationally over the 40 years since that Clean Water Act was passed. But the goal of the Clean Water Act is for our rivers and streams and lakes to be fishable, swimmable, and drinkable. And I'm pretty sure we can all agree that we've got a little ways to go before we reach that goal. 
But it turns out that the main thing that's keeping us from getting there is no longer the big, what I call like the boogeyman of the factory that's discharging things to the river. And that is the case in places, but I think more often than not, and especially here in the St. Joe River, uh, our primary cause that we should be concerned about is, is very different than that. I think the main thing that's causing the pollution issues that we face, and this could be from a habitat standpoint, this could be from a water quality standpoint, bacteria, pathogens, nutrients, all kinds of things like that, comes from polluted runoff. And when I talk about polluted runoff, we're just talking about rainfall or snow melt that, that falls on the ground, and instead of soaking into the ground, it runs sideways over the land on its way to a stormwater drain, a ditch, a creek, a lake, a pond, a wetland, something. But it runs sideways is the idea. It doesn't go in, it goes across. And as it moves across, it picks up some kind of nasty stuff along the way oftentimes, be it road salt this time of year, fertilizer, pet names, uh, agricultural lands, number of things, herbicide, pesticide, you can imagine, even just soil, sediment. I mean, the, the reason I put this picture in here, this is uh, where Boggle Creek means the St. Joe River, known as Boggle Bay, just uh, up by the county line. And you, if you know anything about where Boggle Creek comes from, there's no big nasty factory, there's no wastewater treatment plant, there's nothing like that. It's primarily rural and primarily agricultural. But if you see where it's meeting the river there, you notice there's a very different color to where it's coming in. That's not coming from a factory, that's coming from runoff and all the things that the water picks up on its way to the river. It wasn't always like this. So, I think, I just, I think it's really important to point out, you know, Krista mentioned the uh, Bokagan Band, and, and the land that we're in, you know, prior to European settlement, very little, if any, water made its way to our lakes and rivers as runoff. Like, not only was it not polluted, it just literally didn't move sideways to get to the river went into the ground, and it made its way to the river through groundwater, through seeps and springs. I mean, the, the rivers and lakes really were sort of like surface expressions of groundwater. And that, as you can imagine, is no longer the case. I mean, now we're, what we're looking at here on this map is land cover, if you didn't figure that out. And everything you see up there that's in orange or yellow um, is agricultural land. And what you see in green is the remaining natural land. So that's what we've got left in the way of wetlands, forests, woodlands, prairies, that kind of stuff. We've only got, we have less than a quarter of the remaining natural land that we, we would have originally had prior to European settlement. So that change in land cover has had dramatic impact, not just on the quality of the water in the river because of all the things that it picks up along the way, but the quantity of the water that's in the river. Uh, the, 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 the amount of water that makes its way directly to the river after a snowfall, a uh, snowmelt event, or after rainfall is way higher. And it's not just the things that uh, are there in the way of pollutants, but the water itself can even cause problems. The volume, the, the sheer, the, the amount of water once it gets to the river can cause scouring and rain erosion and all kinds of things that historically wouldn't have been the case. Uh, sorry, I want to make sure I don't miss anything. I guess it shouldn't surprise us that we have problems now, uh, considering the extent of the land cover change that we've seen. Uh, the, the area that you see in orange and yellow up there makes up almost 70% of the land that drains to the St. Joe River is used for agriculture of some kind. And I would say that I think it's important to note because there's so much agricultural land, a lot of times it's easy for us in the city to point upstream at the farmers and say they're causing all of our problems. But the fact is, all of the land uses, residential, commercial, industrial, agriculture, they all cause polluted runoff. And fortunately, there's something that we can do with all of those lands to minimize the negative impact. And that's kind of the heart of the work that I'm trying to do. So, no, I did. <laughs> Sorry. I think I, what I wanted to say with this is that you know we got to uh, a really bad case or bad situation prior to regulating those discharges. We made tremendous improvements by regulating those discharges, but to make up that remaining gap, we're going to be looking at 
voluntary behavioral change. We, we need to, there's no regulation on what you do on your yard. There's no regulation on what farmers do on their land. I hate to break it to you, it's kind of like the last unregulated industry out there. I mean, really, um, property rights and land rights are important to people, and, and uh, we, we can't, or at least not at this point, we're not really regulating what folks do. So, people in the work that I'm doing, we realize that, you know, this, this, the way land is used and managed is the primary driver for a lot of our water pollution. Well, how do we curb it and how do we change it? It requires change in behavior. But if you don't have to change behavior, well, then why would you want to change behavior? So the whole idea of being in this line of work is trying to inspire change and trying to, to be part of um, convincing people to change, but not, not doing it because of why it's important to me. So, so not doing it because of water quality necessarily, but why is it good for you as a farmer or as a homeowner to change your behavior? That's where I feel like the, the real energy is around, is trying to understand what would motivate someone to change their behavior to uh, manage their land in a way that's better for the river. Uh, I've got a couple examples of just different land cover types Apparently I'm an active on Messenger now, uh, but that's all right. Um, I just want to say in agricultural landscapes, there are all kinds of con what we call conservation practices that can be used. The, the photo is showing the difference between uh, what we call conventional tillage on the left side versus no-till on the right side, which um, I'll try not to get into all the details of it, but the idea is that by leaving some mulch on the ground, you'll reduce the amount of soil that moves with the water when we do get a rainfall event. When I go out to talk to people, or when, a lot of times it's not me anymore, but it's someone from the local soil and water conservation district, or someone who specifically works with farmers, they're not going to start right in with, you can clean up the river by converting to no-till. Like, it, it may be that there are farmers out there that really do care about cleaning up the river. I don't doubt that at all. And with those folks, you can talk about that. But where we want to start is, why is this better for your farm? And fortunately, there are a handful of practices like no-till that can have benefits to the farmer beyond water quality, that can save labor, they can save uh, money on fertilizer, and they can make farms more resilient to uh, drought or large rain events, make it easier to get out on the field to harvest or plant crops. So that's kind of the place we start. Even if I'm excited about it because of what it can do for water quality, that's not what I'm going to talk about, and that's not, um, I don't feel bad about it, like I'm sneaking something in on anybody. It's, it, the fact is, what's going to motivate them? Why wouldn't they want to change? And if there isn't anything, if I can't come up with anything, that's probably not where I'm going to start. I'm trying to sell someone on changing their behavior. Do it because I think it's important, and do it because it'll be good to me. So agriculture is one that we work on a lot. Again, I said almost 70% of the land that drinks in St. Joe's used for agriculture. So if we're not making a difference in behavior on those agricultural lands, we're never going to meet that goal of fishable, swimmable drinkable. There's things we can do in our urban areas. This is a picture of South Bend out on Western Avenue. Uh, really excited when they did the, uh, I don't know if this is part of Spark Streets or not, but the, all the street rebuilding project, that uh, the parking spots, they use per permeable pavers. So uh, the water is able to infiltrate into the ground there. I mean, we've got pretty sandy soils around here, and the idea of uh, in, instead of sending all of our water that runs off the streets to the wastewater treatment plant, trying to soak some of that into the ground to be naturally filtered like it would have been prior to paving it in the first place, is just a great idea. And it actually helps the city meet their um, requirements by EPA and save some money at the same time. So there's multiple benefits to it, uh, economic not being the least. And then, of course, we can even go for the aesthetics. I mean, there are things that we can do as homeowners out in residential areas. This is a picture of a rain garden, which is basically just a depression with deep-rooted plants that, that infiltrates water. So again, instead of sending our water to our already overtaxed sewer system, like the sewer system is already maxed out when we get a rain event, if we can create some places where the, the runoff that comes off of our roof to go into some place where it can infiltrate into the ground, great. And if it's a beautiful thing, you know, it's a, it's a, becomes a landscape feature, even better. Let's talk about that. And then, of course, there are things that folks might just want to do just because they think it's the right thing or um, they, they like to show off that they're doing something. And then rain barrels, I think, are a great example of stuff that folks might do to keep that water out of the sewer, keep it from going straight to the river, and be able to use it in a way where it can soak into the ground. That's all I'm going to say about different things.
things we can do. There's, we can go on and on about it. Um, what I want to leave you with, what I hope that you will take from my little part of the talk tonight, is that if you care about the water, like I do, if you care about the river or the lake, these days, you've got to look at what's going on in the land. The land that's draining to that water is where we can make a difference. That's where we can either hold things to protect what's already good or try to restore things to fix what might be uh, damaged. So we need to look at the land that's draining into it, and then we need to look in the mirror and think about what can we do? You know, what, what can, are we leading by example? Um, the, the rain barrel sitting in our basement uh, wasn't doing much good, so I need to get that going. I need to get it on the house so that I'm leading by example. So I'm not, you know, I want to be part of the solution as well, and, and we can all probably do something to, uh, to make a step in the right direction. I'm going to leave it at that. That was giving me a hard time there. I, me, me and Matt hang out quite a bit, uh, doing water or river related stuff. And if I follow him in the presentation, typically I've been listening to him for like an hour and a half. So, uh, nice surprise tonight. Um, so my, <laughs> my name is Dara Deegan. I'm an aquatic biologist. I work for the city of Elkhart in the city of South Bend. We have this um, very unique program where we look at the health of the St. Joseph River through the different types of aquatic organisms up there in the river. Uh, my background is in fish biology and I'm pretty much a fish biologist and the emphasis of our program is looking at the, the fish communities in the river as indicators of health. We do look at some other things like uh, macro invertebrates, if you've ever heard of those, snails, clams, mussels, insects, um, but the primary focus is on looking at fish. Um, the fish can tell us a lot about how healthy the river is because some fish are very sensitive to pollution uh, pollution events, some fish are very uh, tolerant of pollution. And so by looking at the makeup of the fish communities, we can tell a lot about the health of the river. Um, one of the, the, the interesting aspects of our program too, in addition to telling people I get to collect fish, um, I get to use a pretty cool tool to collect fish too. So we use electrofishing as a method uh, for doing fish surveys on the river. This is an electrofishing boat. It has, a, uh, it has two arms that hang off the front as a generator and that generates the electricity. And those two arms that hang off the front put the electricity into the water. Uh, the, fish, the fish will be immobilized when they're uh, exposed to the electricity. We'll scoop them up in a net, we'll put them in a light bulb, and then we'll take them back and look at the different species, and then we take some measurements off the fish and release them back into the river. Um, it is a non lethal method of collecting fish and the most fast and efficient way of doing that in a river system. Pretty, pretty interesting way of looking at fish. Um, so one of the things that our program does um, quite a bit of is, is uh, outreach. And so every year I'm out there collecting fish. I think we, we probably, um, on average, we collect about 25,000 fish in the St. Joe River every year. That's a lot of data. Um, over the winter time, I go through that and sort it out and try and make sense of it. Um, I generate a report and it gets published on the website. Um, we go to Elkhart South Bend Aquatic Biology and find a ton of information on there, including some really cool videos and all. Um, but the other way that we, we, outreach, we do outreach and, and you know, meet the public is uh, through presentations and demonstrations. Uh, we do, I think on an annual basis, we probably need about 5,000 people or to reach about 5,000 people directly uh, through presentations and getting kids down to the river, uh, having them touch fish. Uh, we'll even interact with college groups and have them come down and help us do fish surveys. Um, get, you know, so it's a, it's a very good way of exposing people to fish and the river and what's going on in the river. Um, for my, my, my presentation tonight, I kind of, I've got a couple of slides that duplicate what Matt talked about a little bit. Um, but I'm going to give you just kind of, a, I'm going to talk about the health of the river, but kind of put it in a historical context. Uh, Matt talked a lot about uh, draining the lands and, and how we've changed our landscape. And so the first major thing that we did, obviously, we, when we colonized northern Indiana, was we, we took down the, the trees, we drained the wetlands, and that, that had a huge effect on the river, as Matt talked about. That was the first thing that we did to the river, but it, it still haunts us today, as Matt talked about, right? Um, 
The next big thing that we did to the river was we constructed dams. And so the, on the St. Joe River in, in Indiana and Michigan, we've got 12 major dams. In Indiana, we've got four dams. Um, and they, they really uh, have significant impacts on habitat in the river. Uh, in Indiana, we've got 40 miles of St. Joe River. Uh, approximately 50% of that, so 20 miles of river, are, are impounded. Uh, they used to, that used to be a naturally flowing river uh, with, with species of animals that were adapted to a natural river system. And so now half of it has changed. It's more of like a lake type environment, if you will. Um, those fish and, and other organisms that live there have, have had to adapt to that. Um, the other big thing that dams do is they block fish from moving upstream. Um, stream biologists reckon that uh, about 85% of fish that live in a river have some kind of uh, migration as part of their life history. So some of, most of them will swim upstream and spawn. Uh, some of them will like, overwinter in, in pools like downstream of uh, like shallow moving riffles. But they have to make some kind of migration. And when you have dams there, that impacts migration. And it has a serious impact on biodiversity in the stream. And then Matt talked about kind of that whole idea of industrial pollution. Um, this is kind of, this is pretty grim stuff, but, um, you know, I, I, I stumbled into a report that was issued back in the 1930s by the Michigan Board of Health where they came in and they looked at uh, the impact that, that the residents of Elkhart, Mishawaka, and South Bend were having on the river before we sent it back up into Michigan. Uh, at the time, 175,000 people were sent or put in the sewage directly in the river. Um, on top of that, a couple uh, 100 million gallons of industrial waste being dumped in the river on a daily basis. Um, so the river was essentially dead, and I've got some data that's pretty interesting to show. That. I, I apologize too. I don't. I don't like to throw nasty looking graphs uh, in, in slides, but this is an interesting one. I pulled this directly from that Michigan Board of Health uh, report, and what it shows is um, dissolved oxygen levels. So the top line on that graph right there shows dissolved oxygen levels back in 1931. The EPA reckons that you have to have about five parts per million of oxygen and water to sustain aquatic life. The average concentration of dissolved oxygen back in the 30s was three parts per million. And on several occasions there, that bottom line, that represents low levels of dissolved oxygen. It was pretty close to zero with downtown South Bend. Um, they referenced only three species of fish being in the river uh, in South Bend, only the only most tolerant carp and a couple of catfish species. And the other thing, I don't know if anyone knows anything about E. coli. Does anyone know anything about E. coli? <laughs> a little bit. Um, the EPA standard for making contact, recreational contact with water is 125, okay, 125 E. coli units. They were finding it at 20 million uh, back in the month. Um, but things started to change. Uh, in the 1950s, Elkhart, Mishawak, and South Bend installed wastewater treatment plants. Um, that had a huge effect on the river. And, and perceptions, uh, attitudes towards the river started to change too. There was a professor at, at St. Mary's, Clarence uh, Deneen, uh, biologist, he's a parasitologist. He looked like a parasites in the river, but he was extremely passionate about the St. Joe. And at one point, he uh, was the president of the Indiana Academy of Science and put a report together about the history of the St. Joe River. It's a really cool uh, little paper. And I have a quote that he pulled out. It's kind of kind of interesting. It, it pertains to where we're at tonight. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and read it real quick. Nevertheless, during the last few decades, there's been a decided change in the attitudes of the public towards our lakes and rivers. A plea has been made to make the St. Joseph River a plea has been made a plea to make the St. Joseph River your front yard has been heard. A prime example is Indiana University South Bend, built in 1961, which, constructed, which was constructed to face the river with only a double lane road as a distracted feature. And so what was interesting about that, he goes on to talk about the Century Center also being built to face the river. Um, what's really interesting about that is something as a, I'm a young person, I wasn't around back in the 1930s or back in the early 1900s. I have, no, I have no idea what it looked like, but if you look at old pictures or aerial photographs, you'll notice that all the buildings or businesses or homes were all built to face away from the river because it, it was our sewer back then, right? That's where we used to send the wastewater. It wasn't attractive. Um, 1950s come around and there's, there's a complete change, uh, not only in the health of the river, but also in, in attitudes towards the river. Um, and then Matt mentioned the Clean Water Act a little bit. Um, 
1970s when that kicked in, and then we see even more improvements in the river. Uh, the Indiana Department of Natural Resources came in and looked at fish communities in the 70s in the river and found about 25, 26 species of fish. Uh, complete rebound from those nine, that 1930s data, we were only finding three species of fish in St. Joe. And if you fast forward to uh, the early 2000s, and when we started monitoring in the St. Joe River, we're finding about 50 species of fish in the St. Joe River when we were in South Bend. So a complete rebound and change, right? And we're still doing stuff to improve the river. I'm sure many of you have heard about uh, the combined sewer overflow long-term control plan that, that's costing you a lot of money right now. Uh, but it's for good reason, and it's, it's to, to really reduce the amount of combined sewage that's entering the St. Joe River. Uh, this data is really good. Elkhart, Mishawaka don't have data like this. Um, South Bend's got a really good data set showing how much they've reduced the uh, sewage in the river in the last few years. And you'll see in 2008, after implementing some action within the sewer system, they reduced the amount of combined sewage enter entering the river from about 2 billion gallons on an annual basis down to about a billion. And then in 2011, with some, some additional action, reduced it to about half that amount, too. And so uh, over the next 15, 20 years, that number is going to hopefully get down to zero, right? That's the, that's the goal. Um, and with that, this is, this is some more data. I apologize. But this is my data from the last 15 years. And it kind of it corresponds with that work that we're doing to pull out CSOs, right? Um, our species diversity has increased um, substantially. This is, this is from the Darden Road. I sample at, at a site of Darden Road on the downstream side of South Bend. Uh, our species diversity has increased substantially. And the amount of fish that are considered uh, tolerant to pollution levels has substantially dropped also. All right, with that, here's the fun stuff. I'm done with the data. I'm going to really quickly go through some fish species. Uh, over here in South Bend, I don't know what's going on, especially out here in front of IUSB. You guys like to throw goldfish in. <laughs> What's up with that? And then they get really big, so that's like 14 inches. Um, we've got some really unusual, bizarre fish in the river. This is a, a long nosed gar, or no, this is a spotted gar, a prehistoric species. We've got two species of gar in the river. Um, over in Keller Park, they get really big. That's a five foot long gar that we collected several years ago. Um, prehistoric fish, they have gills like other species. Um, but they also have a modified lung, so when the oxygen levels get low, they can come up and go better. And this is a dinosaur that's swimming around in the St. Joe. Um, right out in front of, well, just, just upstream of here, uh, a few years ago, a uh, 31 pound car. Uh, this is an actually a good sign. We don't like seeing these, they're an invasive, super tolerant species of fish. Uh, but something, something's coming in the water here. It's all that nutrients that Matt was talking about coming from the farm fields to make your carp extra big and juicy over here and stuff. And, but we also have some really cool, bizarre, unusual looking species. This is a northern hog sucker, very intolerant of pollution, uh, very abundant in the St. Joe River right here in South Town. And we also have a, a state endangered species called the Greater Red Horse that's very common out here in front of Bayou SB. Uh, beautiful too, right? Uh, beautiful bright red fins. It's a mollusca horse fish that likes to eat snails, climbs his muscles off the bottom of the river. And uh, here's a picture of Dr. Marr, IUSB, with a, a greater red horse a few years ago. Um, also, in addition to having all these cool, unusual species, the St. Joe River is known as a, a really good smallmouth bass fishery. Um, yeah, those are really nice smallmouth bass. So, um, really, go, ooh, jumped a little bit far ahead, but I, I want to try and show a video here really quickly. Uh, hopefully, it's um, this is, a, this is a fish that we encountered at uh, Kettle Park last year. We're here on the St. Joseph River at Keller Park in South Bend and we've just completed a fish survey and we've encountered a large muskie. And so we're going to pull it out and show it to you. Muskies are native to the Great Lakes. However, I think this fish probably is from a stock fish um, or a stock fishery up in the upper reaches of the Elkhart River watershed. Uh, they stocked them in Skinner Lake and it's likely traveled about 60 to 70 miles to get here to South Bend. So we literally have some river monsters swimming around the St. Joe. Um, this is actually an Elkhart. The one on the right was about 20 pounds, about 40 inches long and we, we didn't have anything big enough to measure big mama here. So, 
likely about 60 pounds or so. All right, with that, that's all I've got, and I do want to pass it off to John. <laughs> And now that you've seen all those, I'm going to convince you to swim in the river. <laughs> um, yeah, those are both really inspiring. Um, I, my name is Jonathan Grant. Um, I'm the artist in residence at the American Church in Paris. Uh, and I'm on loan for a year to a church in Chicago, which probably doesn't seem like it has anything to do with this, because it, it doesn't. Uh, but my background is in art direction and in styling and in um, creating editorials and, and basically all of that is storytelling. Uh, everything, everything that I do is storytelling and is, is just about igniting people's imaginations. So um, I grew up on the St. Joseph River and specifically not far from Bago Creek and Bago Bay that he showed uh, in a neighborhood called Twin Branch in Mishawaka. Um, somehow a part of our community that was like very river oriented. My my grandparents swam and boated, like everyone we knew was very engaged in the river, and probably because we didn't know about all the pollution levels. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm thankful that I did not did not know these things. Um, at, I went off to college and eventually moved to France. And I think my time in France was the first time that I was in a, in a space where I every day saw, saw a river, which I did growing up every day I saw the St. Joseph River. But in Paris, it was the first time I saw a river every day that no one would let me get in. Uh, which is like, it's a painful thing when you're used to like always having access to something to be, to be denied it. And it was the first time that I saw the role of people's imaginations uh, and how that uh, imagination controlled their, their access. And in Paris, uh, I did not even meant to talk about this, but that's where we're going. <laughs> uh, in Paris, uh, every day I'm walking with friends along the Seine and, and I'm like, oh, dang, I just want to be in that water. And people are horrified. Uh, and you kind of get the same narratives as far as like why you shouldn't be in that, in that water. Um, the it will it will drag you under and you will perish or or you know terrible pollution it will it will poison you and um, n never mind that like right by my apartment every day the the Paris fire department would swim every day they were there swimming um, it was always impressive but. Uh, Somehow that did not that didn't translate to public access, and and still uh, in the minds of Parisians, the river is something which is not to be touched. Um, so back in South Bend, I, obviously I'm denied all this swimming, and when I get back here for a few months a year, swimming is all I want to do, and um, especially uh, my. My brother and our friend Sam is here, like people who are really activated to you. And I mean, these guys are in, these guys are up here too because they're in the water every day. Um, and when I'm back in South Bend, uh, swimming is what like occupies my day. Two or three times if, if I'm good. Um, and what my brother and I specifically have witnessed on these daily swims is a gradual shift in the health of the river. Which, which they've outlined, um, which really co closely corresponds to me, uh, not just to the cleanliness of the river, but also towards, the, towards a, a simultaneity in reimagining ownership of our community. So I, I, it's not disconnected to me that like Heron are back along the river at the same time where people are, are starting to think like, does our flag represent us as as a community of South Bend? It's like there's there's a simultaneity to to public imagination and and accessing and like igniting our connection with these things. Um, so I haven't done anything spectacular. What? Um, oh, I have pictures. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Um, 
what I have done is just, uh, with my friends and family, is just keep showing up. Uh, swimming every day, Sam boats to church every Sunday. I just find that so impressive. Using our tools, Instagram, Facebook, cell phones, community spaces, conversations, we just keep posting about the river, getting people to engage with the river, uh, to know that they have a right to the river, to boat, to swim, to be. Um, what this looks like for me is that like, in previous years, I've done takeovers of the Visit South Bend Mishawaka Instagram account, uh, where I can showcase the river, and other spaces that are really sacred to me. And they just kind of give me free reign to like, tell a different narrative about South Bend. Um, well, the whole region. Um, uh, this past summer, I was back for the whole summer, and so I, I hosted a weekly gathering at the Notre Dame Boathouse called Sunday Supper and Swim, where we would just gather and picnic and swim. And for many of my friends, this was the first time that they had ever been in the river. Uh, you know, everyone's been by the river, but uh, for even people that are close to me, they were a little horrified and a little scared to try it. Um, uh, but whether swimming alone, as I do each day, or with a group, which I try to do each day, um, there's always spectators who stop and ask questions. And I bet you guys get this all the time too, yeah. Um, skaters, runners, bikers, families, uh, they yell from the bank, like, so many questions. Um, and a, a lot of times these, these questions have to do with their mythologies that they've built up uh, around what, what the river has been like in the past or what they perceive or what, you know, kind of what the rumors are. Um, so our practice is always to like, for, I mean, we're always inviting like, hey, the water is amazing, this is fun, like, join us. We're always inviting um, and, and educating. Um, I'm gesticulating too wildly. Uh, educating, like, it, you know, it's safe here, like, be careful there's rocks over there, like, um, we, you know, Sherry, my, my brother and I are both lifeguards, uh, so we kind of share, like, safety tips with people who are maybe not uh, used to swimming in spaces like that. And, um, I mean, most, most of the time people are still hesitant. They leave those interactions still hesitant. Sometimes we get a, like, honey, hold my phone. Like, I'm going in. Like, I'm, like, I'm going to try this. Here are these crazy kids doing this. Like, what's the worst that could happen? Um, and I've learned uh, to separate um, the, the, the questions of passerby into two categories. And here's uh, where my, this is, this is where what I, I think what I have to say might get a little like challenging. Uh, of course, uh, it, falls, it falls into two categories. The is it safe as category number one, and are we allowed as category number two. Um, both of these are topics of, um, of imagination because we don't have uh, we don't have public policy on this, or we don't have a narrative of public policy, even if it does exist. Like it's hard to find or access. Uh, even I mean, uh, even my brother who lives on the river, kid, uh, still has trouble finding out like what the what the legalities are or what the like specific rules are, which I'm sure you can speak to a little more too. Um, so our the public imagination is, um, is, is, is these two questions. Is it safe and are we allowed? Um, and consistently, the folks who ask, is it safe, uh, were, uh, were white people. Were people who have been in the community and hold on to these mythologies from the past, uh, or rumors, uh, mostly like, won't we grow an extra limb? Or could we turn orange? Um, these are the questions. Um, consistently in, in these interactions, it's people of color, often those who live in closest proximity uh, with the river itself, that don't know that they have permission to be in the river if they've chosen to. Uh, many of these people live uh, 
directly adjacent to the river in formerly redlined neighborhoods. Um, and we can, we can say surely not, and this can't be a thing, uh, but I see it every day. And I, I, it's, I, I, I ran this by uh, a lot of my friends that I like in, swim with and boat with, and it's, it's, it's the commonality between these two questions. Um, every day I'm in the river and every day I interact with passersby passers who, who fall in these categories uh, and I'm aware with uh, certainty that, that um, most folks in our community in general don't know that they're allowed to swim in the river, um, but it is primarily our people of color in the community who don't feel allowed to interact with it. Um, access to natural resources is always a racial issue. Uh, we think of Flint, um, how hard uh, people of color there have fought for, for healthy and safe water. Um, uh, with the BP uh, oil spill in the Gulf, like these, it's, there's consistently a connection and though, though our historical narrative is not one of of harm for people of color because we've been primarily been a uh, homogenous white European uh, settlement. Um, it, it is an issue now. And uh, I think a lot, a lot of what I would love, what I am aiming at with my work just around, which is really play, my play around being in the river and my play around uh, photographing the river and, and creating experiences in the river um, is, is that, and this is kind of a growing edge for, for us, is that we have, to, we have to ignite people's imaginations towards uh, the spaces where they're allowed to be and the things that they can take ownership of. Um, uh, to create justice, we have to use every tool at our disposal. And, uh, and this involves, I, I think there's, there's a connection between uh, creating justice and creating clean rivers in that in order to do both we have to insert our bodies like if there is injustice we have to put our bodies in the way of that injustice and and to create clean rivers we literally have to put our bodies in the river we have to see things from that perspective uh, from the perspective of the things that are are most likely to be harmed or disenfranchised by that so For sure, we've met before because I was out there in my canoe, usually pretty alone. <laughs> and I see this group of people swimming in the river, and I asked you about it, and it, to me, it was so inspiring. I loved it. I'm like, great, there's other people using the river. So now I know where we met. That's yeah, right. yeah. yeah, I was just seeing if maybe you were carrying in the background. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I know I've kayaked by it. <laughs> um, there we go. Oh, so I, um, I'm going to take the right of the podium. I have one question for each of you, and then I'm sure there's questions out there, some intriguing, um, inspiring things you want to find out a little bit more about. Um, I'm going to try and show some of these pictures uh, as we go. Okay. Um, so, Matt, you said uh, you're delighted to see that people already care. And you shared some examples of what people could do. Like, if you really care, you really have to put this, these values into action, right? Um, so, what are you doing? I know you can do. So, do you have a rain garden? Right. I mean, lead the way for it here. What are you doing? Yeah, right. As far as managing my property, terror. So, <laughs> I, I mean, I've disconnected the car. We've disconnected our gutters from from okay. the downspout. That's. That's about as far as we run. We, uh, we don't use fertilizer on our yard or pesticide or anything like that. Um, directly connected though, I mean, I walk everywhere. We, we, we don't use our vehicles, but not enough. I mean, we've got a section of our driveway that's getting buckled and busted up, and I'm like, I'm going to put pervious pavement there when I do it, you know. Well, you already have pervious pavement. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so not enough like that. I, I really do. 
um, when I'm trying to feel better about that stuff, I just think about like the, the getting out there and, and inspiring people. But man, if you came to my house, there wouldn't be anything to point to that would be all that inspirational, I don't think, unless I'm not giving myself credit for something. Yeah, oh, yeah, man, I planted all kinds of native plants along our riverbank. That's one thing we've done. Is that what you were talking about? Yeah, yeah I planted all kinds of That's native plants. That's kind of a thing. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you for your honesty, because I know I get these questions a lot. I'm like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. So how kind of like wouldn't you like well you should do this you know I recognize it's hard and so I think that that helps and, and I want to, I want to get there. So, uh, sure. so you showed lots of really cool fish pictures, but I have to know what is a fish that most surprised you, good or bad? Besides that giant disgusting carp. The, um, that most surprised you, for good or bad, that you, you found in the same show, maybe in the last year or something, you can say, well, you know, coolest thing because it was a good indicator or a bad indicator that. Uh... Sure. Um, well, I'll be honest, so we, we, we pretty much discovered most of the species that are out there on the river. We do encounter uh, some unusual implants from aquariums sometimes. Um, one year we uh, stumbled into some red bellied paku from the Amazon. Um, <laughs> Big, not eating fish uh, with giant jaws on them. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, there's not that many in there. Uh, but I, I, so I, I've really become fascinated with uh, lampreys in the river. And actually, so uh, Andy Schnabel is, is here too. He's a, a Professor at IUSP, he's kind of working with me on uh, a collaboration to uh, investigate lampreys a little bit more. But we have four species of lampreys in the river. Um, they're an extremely primitive animal, um, estimated to be about 400 million years old. Um, and there's the, the four species that we have, two of them uh, are parasites, so they're fish that suck a lot of other fish. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just, just fish, though. They don't like, they don't like people. Um, and two of them don't. They have like this filter feeding habit, and uh, they're, but they're just these bizarre, uh, incredible animals that no one quite really understands. There's not really been any. There hasn't been much research on them. Um, one of the, the two of the species that we have, uh, one of them uh, is a parasite. Uh, the other isn't, but maybe they're the same species because they are the same species because they're genetically identical. Um, but they have two totally different behaviors as adults. Uh, it's it, it's correct from a scientific perspective. It's pretty crazy stuff. Um, and the other thing about the lampreys too is they they have this really weird life cycle relative to other fish. They spend the first four years of their life buried down in the sediment, um, and after four years they emerge. Uh, they met. They go through a metamorphosis. Um, some of them grow these suction cups for sucking the blood of other fish. We do this filter feeding, but. Just this bizarre animal that has a life cycle like a cicada um, and a fish. So, yeah, there you go. That's <laughs> super cool. I love learning stuff like this because we live in a really cool place. Like, we have cool stuff here. Um, even if we never see them, right? Maybe not see them. But to just knowing that they're there and seeing that the stuff that you're scooping up when you're shocking is, is fascinating. I think it gives me a lot of pride. So, thank you. So, um, Jonathan, I love that you used imagination as a, a theme because there's so much to imagine uh, when it comes to water and to rivers that are, are moving and, and are really vibrant, alive entities in a lot of ways. And it really does stir the imagination. But I'm wondering, um, using your imagination, um, what future do you imagine for the St. Joe River? If you were, maybe if you, Maybe you would leave and go to Paris again. I don't know why you would stay here um, all the time. Uh, when you came back in maybe five years, ten years, what can you? What would you imagine as being <sighs> dream come true? Hmm. Um, I mean, I think I think some of us share the imagination of of like people who are of a community that is like 
really engaged with the river and like experiencing it on a daily basis. Uh, and I I think some of that some of that can't happen until we have uh, public swimming. Or like like pe like uh, spaces where people know that it's safe and there's supervision for for people to be in the river. Um, and I'm also I'm, I'm fascinated by uh, spaces I've seen in Germany where uh, where you have like uh, the the platform the floating platform by the boathouse for instance, which I'm obsessed with, um, where you would have like pontoon spaces like that that have cafes on them and like. That kind of engagement, like it's it's not enough to to be adjacent to the river to walk by it, but we need to give people like uh, entry points to being on it or in it, and um, yeah, I, I think it's gonna take some things like that, like canoe rentals or spaces to swim, um, and I think that will ignite people's imaginations towards the health of the river and, and towards like where where they collectively want to. Be. But I think within 10 years, I think those three things would be my priorities. So maybe you could talk with Matt and then you've got a crooked U connection and they can put a little floating job here. <laughs> um, but I also want to mention, you said what you do isn't spectacular, but I, I would disagree um, because you're really acting on your passion and putting it into play and sharing that with others. And that is really hard for most people to do. So, so thank you for, for that. Um, and all of you are showing up in your own ways to, to do what you need to do to enact your passion. Um, but I'm wondering if you can give all of us something to show up and do. So if you could say, hey, here's something you can do for the love of rivers. Uh, what would that be? I'll start. I, you know, I, I, right off the top of my head, one of the things is, as we, if you're from the city of South Bend here, you live here, the city of South Bend, um, we're going to be faced with a big price tag for correcting our sewer infrastructure. I mean, we've done a lot. Garz points out some slides. We've done some really great things, but we still have a little ways to go. And that last step is going to be the most expensive. It's going to be really expensive. It's, I guess think about it in, in a different way. I, I recognize that some of us are in better financial situations than others, and for some people they just simply can't afford another dime, but uh, think about how important it is to, to clean it up, to get to a point where Jonathan's not going to get sick from swimming in the river, and, and that, that there's, a, there's a price tag for that because we want to use the land in a certain way. I mean, we're not going to go back, we're not all going to live here and go back to natural landscapes or to, to totally natural land cover. So there's a, there's a cost. We have to manage the impact of this many people moving about in this space, and that's not cheap to do it right. And so it's not a carte blanche, just a check to do whatever, but it's, it's going to cost a little money in, in, to. Try to supply, I, I don't know, I feel like my to try to support the people at the city that are trying to do the right thing with this. I don't feel like they're trying to spend money just willy-nilly or whatever. They're trying to do as best they can to, to have the, the river clean and do right by the citizens. I don't know, that's the first thing that I think of. And bridging off of that, I had a conversation a few months ago with Lauren Strobel Trap. I'm not sure. Um, she, who's with the with sanitation, like uh, for the for the city, and um, one of the things that came up in conversation is that like one of the greatest potential threats to our river is is actually the process that makes it, it that makes it the most clean. That like the um, they treat the sewage with bacteria, and then they have to kill the bacteria. Um, I can't remember what they use for the chlorine. Chlorine, yeah. and. Uh, and then when they release it, it's clean, but the potential for the chlorinated water to leak into the river and not just kill wildlife, but to kill people, to be like a human disaster is like really high. And so we, we got searching and it's actually super affordable to get uh, ultraviolet uh, to, treat, to treat this in the same way. 
and it would be exponentially safer, and it would make uh, it would be it would save the money, the city money in the long run. So that's one thing that's like uh, we should, we could just crowdfund in the next year and just do for the city. I mean, other than that, my my answer, of course, is like get in the river. I'm sure there's people here who have not swim. <laughs> the only rule being, we still give it a few days after it rains. <laughs> Because uh, it's not there yet, but we'll get it there. So I guess for me, um, I, it's, it's funny, so I'm, a, I'm an environmentalist. Um, I love the river, and uh, I've been working with Matt for, I don't know, I've known Matt for about 10 years now. I've been involved with friends, friends in the St. Joe with Matt and, and his wife, Danielle. And, um, you know, over the years, I've been kind of learning a lot about the watershed and people in the watershed. and. Uh, I've always been fired up about, you know, issues that are affecting the river and uh, like some legislation comes up at the state house that's going to impact the river and I get all mad and, uh, you know, who do I need to call or, uh, you know, or farmers are to blame for everything and, you know, I'm just super mad about everything. But um, over the years and actually just in the last couple of years, and a lot of this is, has been inspired by Matt and, and Jonathan is, uh, I mean, he's, 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 Walk and, and he's walking the talk here on this one, but it's just the idea of people making contact with the water somehow. Like I, I've known some people that, not necessarily environmentalists, um, that have started kayaking in the last few years or just interacting with the river somehow, and the mindset <coughs> so rapidly once that person starts using the resource. Um, so for you folks, if you could start using the resource, but also advocate for others to start using the resource somehow, whether it be just walking by the river or interacting with it somehow, um, that will definitely help make change. Thanks. And there is a, a public boathouse there where people, you can store your boats. If you know someone who maybe has a boat there, you want to borrow, I'm happy to put you on the water um, with a life check. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to stop talking, as I know you all have some questions, and I'm sure they have lots more they could talk to you about with the river. So. Um, for Matt, how does the health of the Central River compare to the rest of Indian rivers? Um, where is it right on the scale of? Man, I, I don't know if I'm the, if I'm the look for Dara to help me on this one. Um, I think from a... Uh, sort of geological perspective, like the soils that we have here, and, and we do have a few more remaining wetlands than most of the state of Indiana, I would say it tends to fare a little better. If nothing else, it's less flashy, Tim. Like, so when we get a rain event, it doesn't spike up and then crash back down quite as fast as, you know, the Wabash River system or something like that. Those rivers tend to be really flashy. They spike up flooding as a major issue along those rivers, and we don't we don't really face that so much here in the St. Joe. So I would say it tends to fare better than other rivers in Indiana, but not nearly as well as other rivers in Michigan. Yeah, and I, I mean, I don't, I mean, Matt nailed it. The only other thing I would add to that is um, one of the reasons why the St. Joe River is in such good shape is that it comes out of Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> the land, like you, you cross the line and you can just see the change in the landscape, right? There's so much more woodlands and wetlands out there. And so the quality of the water coming out of Michigan it's a lot better than the quality of water coming out of India in the same time. <clears throat> um, are our dams a good thing? Or should we should we join other parts of the country that have, have opted to uh, to get rid of dams? Yeah, um, so I'm I'm a big uh, I'm I'm a big opponent to dams. I, I don't like them at all. Just as a stream biologist and ecologist, I they, they have a detrimental effect on, on stream ecology, and um, I think that they need to come out. Part of, part of the problem is that we've built communities around these impoundments and dams, right? Um, you know, if, if we were to take the dam out downtown South Bend, that would have a pretty substantial impact on the, the urban landscape, right? Um, and people that have built up downstream of the dam, upstream of the dam. So some dams need to stay from a cultural perspective. Um, but if I had it my way, they would come out from an ecological perspective because they cause so much damage. But do you, so do you mean that culturally they would affect the community, waters would 
act differently about the dams or, or, or yeah, so, so a, big, a big part of it is, well, first of all, it's the aesthetic of the dam, right? But then the, the other component is the pool that's created behind the dam. And it, not, not so much here in downtown South Bend, but like if you get into Elkhart County, um, we have some of the, the most expensive homes uh, built on the impoundment behind the Johnson Street Dam in Elkhart. Some of the wealthiest people in the county live in that stretch of river. People use speed boats and jet skis and all that. Uh, without the dam there, uh, you wouldn't be able to do that, right? And so from a cultural perspective, uh, it needs to stay. Which kind of produces an interesting paradox in a way, because in Elkhart, it, in a way, it creates this opportunity to interact with the water. And in fact, where you were at, it's the yeah, same yeah. thing. I mean, he was in the water because it felt more like a lake in some ways than it did like a river. But I think you can probably see the other side of it, and that is where we have moving water, it tends to appear cleaner. You don't have weed growth, it doesn't, it's not mucky, um, you know, it's ripply and kind of moving. It just, it feels a little, I, I think it feels more approachable in a way, unless you're just really scared of current or something like that. Um, so you can kind of almost see it both ways from a, being what, wanting to engage in it that, it, that it can, the dams can create a, an access, but they can also sort of limit and prevent access. So the 12 different dams we have on the river, does that kind of create like 12 different ecosystems or are they all pretty similar in terms of the biodiversity in each? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, they, they would be very similar um, from an ecosystem perspective, but they, they all vary a little bit. Like some dams are bigger than others and upstream of those dams, there's different sized tributaries coming in and so they could vary in length. Um, the one that we had, the big dam at, at Mishawaka, the Twin Branch Dam, that creates an impoundment that's about 12 miles long. Uh, the dam that's out here uh, in South Bend, that creates an impoundment that's about four miles long. Um, so just based on like a kind of a spatial perspective, they, they have different effects on the river. Um, and you'll have fish communities that have adapted to, you know, some of those characteristics that are there. But yeah, from, from, from uh, I guess, they, they all pretty much have the same kind of effect on the river, though. Um, and you're pretty much going to find the same species of fish and other aquatic organisms behind the dams. And because the dam is there and you have an impoundment there, it's, it's, it's a non-natural uh, environment, right? It's essentially, from an ecological perspective, it's a disturbed ecosystem. And so it's typically host to invasive species, it attracts invasive species, um, and it usually has, the dams usually have a lot of polluted sediment behind them, um, so they're usually a lot, a lot more of a disturbed ecosystem. One of the, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, add one thing, one, one of the things Dara touched on at the end there, that if we're, if we're thinking in time scales like the Volcagan Band of the Potawatomi, these, these dams have a short life on them. I mean, they're filling in behind it at all times, so they're unnaturally free of sediment on the downstream end, and the sediment is just stacking up on the back side of it to the point where eventually these things will be completely full. They won't be like lakes that we can see boat on anymore because they're filling up with sediment. And so they're, in a sense, they're time bombs for us as communities and that at some point we will have to deal with them, uh, not from a failure perspective, but from a fact that they don't serve the purpose that uh, they were originally built for and that what, what now we need to use them for. And so I, I don't want to go too much more on dams here, but a lot of the small low head dams are starting to fail around the country. Um, their infrastructure that were, were put in in the late 1800s or uh, mid 1800s, they're getting old and they've reached the end of their lifespan, so they're starting to fail. Um, and you know, agencies across the country have recognized now we need to pull these things out to try and restore ecosystems and. <clears throat> And that type of thing, but it's difficult from a cultural perspective because people grew up around the dam. Even if it doesn't have a big pool behind it, they still grew up with it. It's in, it's part of their community. We have a waterfall on Waterfall Drive in downtown Elkhart. That's a dam that I want to pull out, but it's it's the waterfall on Waterfall Drive, right? So. <laughs> um, but what impact do waterfall have on the ecosystem of the river and? Like I'm swimming, especially the geese and the. Yeah, um, 
I mean, I can, I can tackle that one. Um, the, the geese, so the geese, uh, <laughs> the geese are an interesting thing, but they're, um, we, we kind of created the urban environment is like optimal for Canada geese. Um, and, you know, these grass lawns that with non native grasses and stuff, those things just a little bit. And, and uh, they kind of come in and stay for winter because people start feeding them and yada yada yada. Um, but they do have an impact on water quality. They, they poop a lot. If you walk along the, <laughs> the sidewalks along the river, you see a lot of poop from these things. And uh, there's been a lot of testing done downstream of some of these sites where there's goose poop and the E. coli level are very high. This um, right to the uh, downstream side of the boathouse, the city of South Bend removed a lot of the ground cover. Uh, do you know, is there some kind of, is that part of the plan? <laughs> 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 I've always been the same yeah. Yeah. We've actually called on this, Steve. So <laughs> <laughs> we've called them about this. And uh, you'll notice now they put signs out there that say it's part of a uh, invasive species removal, that there was a lot of honeysuckle in there, which I don't doubt that there was. It's a disturbed environment, it's no surprise. Yeah, but it was holding the bank there. And there's no question, as soon as they did it, we had a lot more dirt and sediment on the sidewalk at the base of that hill. And so I think um, it was not, I mean, I, I hope it was part of a righteous effort to remove invasive species, which uh, is, is a whole other subject, uh, but but I think it was also part of an effort to improve the view for the new development across the street. I don't think it could be. They said they had planned like natural grass. They said they did. Terry said that they planned to, but I don't know who wants to remove debris right in fall when rain starts and not think about erosion. So I, I'm not really sure how they will plan that. They might. They say they're going to. Man, so that's something we can all do, I guess, right? Getting back to that. This is plants. What do you want? Right. Don't take the plants out of the Did you notice when they were spraying along there and killing all the woody vegetation along the river I didn't last notice summer? Some spray spraying. Oh, spray yeah. Yeah. Is, yeah. is there policy around that? Is there like unofficial like city or county Are we allowed to do right? that? <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, I mean, it's city property, so the city parks department can do what they wish with it. I don't think there's any like state laws or anything that would regulate what they can do with it. But I mean, that certainly would be an opportunity. There's certain herbicides you can't spray in the water, but since they're not technically on the water, they can use whatever's legal to use them. You know? uh, but I think that is an opportunity where we can, you know, speak up and, and say, you know, that having some kind of rooted vegetation in place at all times is really important. So, yeah, I, we were pretty, we live right across the river from there, so we were pretty upset about that. Yeah, I think the more people that speak up, the more chances that we're going to get what yeah, I think we want, was, which yeah. is the important thing. Matt, I heard you were working in a cool project on phosphorus. I don't know. Well, I, yeah, I, don't, I don't know what that would be. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yeah. I got a <laughs> I got one really cool project that I'd love to talk about, but I don't. It does, and it potentially in the future could address phosphorus. Right now, it's pretty much sediment. But. Yeah. Jonathan, what are you doing to <coughs> regions to love the, their river? It's so the firefighters. Oh well, I mean. That's not true, but too. I, I mean, everyone that I know in Paris sees this. They're they're seeing whatever's going on in South Bend, and I mean, I, I, I know that like sometimes we think of South Bend as a place that's isolated, but there's enough crossover. Uh, I know enough people in in Paris that are seeing this on a daily basis. That like, there's a good 300 people who are like. South Bend is the most exotic, wonderful, <laughs> difficult place in the world. I, one day I'll have a house in South Bend. <laughs> if, they're, if they're good. Um, so I mean, I think, I think, I think creating, I think spark, like encouraging each other's imaginations here uh, is igniting 
the world's imagination for what's possible because we have more access to our natural resources in South Bend than most people uh, in their communities anywhere in the world. Like, I mean, I should say most. I don't have the stats on that. But uh, it, in Paris, it was it would be unthinkable for someone for a normal person to say like. Uh, we need more ground cover along this along this bank. How do we do that? It, everything happens so secretly and so uh, you know far removed from our interaction, which is just part of our yeah the amazing part of, of our public ownership. Okay, um, I have a very highly imaginative mind. Matt knows I have an irrational fear of imaginary predators. <laughs> so I kinda, I've had it with Matt for a long time now. And so I love being on the river, but then I'm kind of horrified at what might be underneath me. And I don't want to go in it, the swimming part. I've swam against my will when I've tipped a boat over. But what other animals, wildlife, do you see that might be you know, like the first time the beavers showed up between Logan and Ironwood, mm -hmm. I was absolutely fascinated until it swam right next to my boat and slapped its tail so hard that I about had a heart attack and doubled it on the boat. And then I would have been there with that really big fish. So what other like interesting wildlife are you seeing when you go out and are checking for fish that might be unusual for this area? We beavers don't generally. Yeah. 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 I know beavers don't have any things too. I know. <laughs> To be honest, I, I don't I don't think there's anything out there in the river that could hurt you. I, I have heard of northern pike um, biting people's feet before um, because they think they're like you know like a fish tail or something like that. Um, well, the gar used to scare me because you know yeah you see them flapping on the top right yeah um, and then um, but yeah there's nothing out there that's going to hurt you if, you if you get up close to a snapping turtle and provoke it you might get a bit. Um, but other than that, there's nothing out there that's going to hurt you. But there has been like a re like a reestablishment and, uh, of uh, river otter yeah, in, in the St. Joe. They're super elusive <coughs> animals. Um, they're out there. Um, I've seen pictures of them here in South Bend. Uh, there's a ton of mink on the river. Those are seen by people daily. I see them out there on the river daily. They're they're a small version of a river otter essentially. Uh, but the, there are some big river otters still out there. In the downtown? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think of anything else. Well, yeah, I mean, beyond that. Uh, but that's, a, yeah. But that's so cool, though. It is very cool, right? Yeah. Uh, yes, I just have another hand in the middle there. So. Okay. Yeah. For people who have their reservations about getting in the water, what's one of the best places to tell them to start? Um, I know, say, say you don't know if the person's a strong swimmer or not. Are there places where the current is a little bit trickier or there might be weird rocks on the bottom? Um, I know for me, when I'm checking out a new body of water and I just want to go have a dip, the part that I'm most concerned about is the entry, finding a good entry point where I'm going to be able to get out easily. Lots of times it's spontaneous, so I'll slip off my shoes and I'm like, ooh, how far am I going to sink into this mud? Have people been fishing here or going to get a hook through my foot or that sometimes like the rocks are really painful <laughs> to maneuver around. <laughs> once, uh, once you can't reach that's the bottom, why I it's cold the, free. The Notre Dame boathouse because I like to just, I don't want to touch rocks or yeah. things. Or, it's uncomfortable. So uh, it's and good. it depends on the season as far as like safety. Like I, until July, it seems a little too swift sometimes for like, I wouldn't like, like I would swim in it, but I wouldn't invite necessarily friends until it like slows down. Yeah, I was going to say there's a couple different things to take into account, but regardless of where on the river footwear, like you got to have something on your feet. Even, I mean, I know you guys get away with it at the dock because it's fairly deep enough and you're not like spiking in to where you want to touch the bottom because Lord knows what's in there in the way of old dumping and that kind of stuff. But so, so the dock at the boathouse has a couple of really great advantages to it. One, if you're a good swimmer uh, and or if you just wear a life jacket, you can, it's, the access is really easy. That you can, it's like a pool site. You can literally slip your feet in the water, slip in, you can get right back out. It's also fairly close, fairly close to the dam, which I'm saying is a good thing, 
because you've got less current there, but it's plenty far enough away from the dam that you're not going to just all of a sudden drift down and now you're at the dam. Uh, unless you want. Right. But, but, so, so in one sense, I could see that being probably one of the better places. However, um, if, if you do want to kind of see what you're stepping on and, and you want to ease into the water, uh, so a place like Keller Park is a place where there, there's a little, little gradual entry on the inside of a bend, so it's a slower current. But I mean, anywhere on the river, it, you need to be aware of the current. So you're you're better off if you, if you're from this area and you probably have never swam in moving water before. You're better off playing in a stream like Christiana Creek or something smaller to get a feel for moving water. I mean, it's very different from swimming in a lake to be in in moving water. It has its own kind of issues that we should be aware of, but that's what makes the boathouse dock one of the better places because it's more like a lake than it is in a river, unless it's at a high water event. Okay, great. So, uh, last question. We've had one already. Anyone else that had it ask it? Is it necessarily a question? I guess it's more of a, like I was thinking about, so I lived out west for a long time, and it's interesting because the, it's like the, how people consider the rivers that are there and the woods and everything, it's just a different thing. Like you're part of that, even if in any community that I've lived in, the river is part of the community and it's part of it, like what you're speaking to is like because everyone's using it to kayak and to hang out and the inner tube down and to like everything and the snow melts into the river. So as soon as you're done skiing, you're going kayaking with that same water and it's just, and you don't want to dump anything in it because you're eating the fish out of it, and you're drinking it, and you're playing in it. And it's such an integrated part of, it's just part of what you do and how you live. And it's interesting because growing up here, like you never touch the river. Oh my God, don't get in the river. It's gross, or you're gonna drown in the undertow, like the whole thing. And then going out there, you're like, oh, all you do is get in the river, and all you do is use like, play in that environment and then coming back this way it's an interesting juxtaposition because it's like oh wait it's back to like people throw junk on their lawns and they don't think about that wait you're drinking that and that so it's just and so i don't know if it's not really a question it's just an interesting maybe perspective but then or maybe the question is how do you go from a play like that it's just part of the conversation and that's how you behave is that this is something you want to take such good care of because it impacts you and everyone around you and and then back and forth to like oh wait it hasn't even it's just the beginning of a conversation so i don't know what to do with that or I think the mythology that you were referencing as well as the fact like there's good reason that as an older industrial city we did not want to go with right. the river and thank you for sharing those stats because now we really know where that's coming from that our grandparents right. are recent to right. the river. But then there's still this mythology around this. Stigma, right? Stigma. Yeah. I think that the work that Jonathan is doing and, and I guess myself in a way being out there paddling on it is incredible because I've had the same experience as you. And as I sit up thinking about what Jonathan shared his experiences from Paris, I think some of it has to do with how long we've been developed and civilized. So in Europe, we've been there doing this thing for a really long time. Here in the Midwest, been doing it not very long compared to Europe, but compared to the West, a lot longer. So like the, the amount of natural space and, and open land is, is way higher there, but it's higher here than it is in Paris. So, so you're, you're getting further and further removed, uh, or closer and closer to, that resource that you recognize from having spent some time out there. But I think it takes people, and it's great to see that, that we're people that, not transplants from out west, that said, hey, we're going to act like we did there and do it here. We're actually from here and saying, no, it's not like that anymore. Let's do it. Let's use it. Let's, let's pretend we're out west and get on the east race and go whitewater kayaking. Like, this is great. So. The, the, the exception, of course, is Chicago, which is uh, like has traditionally been like much worse than Paris or London. Like its river is was like had to be dammed up and like yeah, it was like toxic beyond. I, I don't even know how that <clears throat> there's a category for that. I'm sure, but um, and there are there are really 
I mean, they've done they've done a lot recently, but there's a there's a lot of like really brave people there who are like, we are gonna kayak on this. Like, there's a there's a boating team uh, that you should actually follow on Instagram. I can get their handle. Um, who are just on it every day, uh, and it's something that's still pretty toxic and like they're they're yeah combating that. <laughs> well, it really wasn't a river to be. <laughs> It was a man-made sanitary canal, so it's, it, it didn't have great start. <laughs> the, the other thing that I kind of think a little bit about too, with, with your comments, are like so. And, and Matt has kind of taught me this a little bit over the years. Is like out west, water is a resource that really needs to be protected, right? Like it's it's uh, in short supply, right? Uh, in, in the Midwest and especially in the Great Lakes region, water is a nuisance. Uh, we when we colonized the land, we wanted to get rid of water as quickly as possible, and we still do because we have this overabundance of water, right? So just that idea that it's it's a nuisance is, is perhaps kind of you know. I think that I think that is like it is the maybe that like overarching thought, and maybe that it, yeah, I can hear like that definitely. I mean, even here, snow is a nuisance. Where like out west or north, like, it's like a, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they're not rushing off, they promised me they were not rushing off. So if you still want to ask them something, discover something, have a conversation about the river, whatever, what can you swim next, whatever. <laughs> How can I help you scoop the fish out of the river? Uh, they're going to be here, so feel free to, to chat with them. Feel free to come back next week. We're not talking about rivers, though. Um, we, if the talk is called Sustainability's Brand, so it's taking a business perspective on sustainability initiatives. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So hopefully we see you back here sometime in upcoming Wednesdays. Uh, but thank you so much to our panelists. This evening.